Welcome to the second part of us, the second session on entrepreneurial experimentation. You recall from last time and from the time before that ideas, an idea can have associated with it several business models that can bring that idea to market. And you'll recall that there's an issue of how do we select which business model for our venture. As you'll see in this lecture, it basically has to do with whether we're going to uh, experiment or not and how we should experiment. But let me explain. You recall that last time we distinguished business models on the basis of two dimensions, whether you compete or you cooperate with established firms in your market or whether you seek to and whether you seek to control or engage in execution as your primary driving force behind the business. There were trade-offs associated with each of those decisions, and those trade-offs gave rise to distinctive business models, which we labeled as this. If you competed, if you competed with established firms but sought to control, you engaged in what's called an architectural strategy. If you competed with established firms and sought to execute, it was a disruptive strategy. If you focused on execution and you cooperated with existing firms, you were in a value chain strategy. And finally, if you sought to control assets and cooperated with established firms, you were in an intellectual property strategy. So how do you decide on a business model? This is the Lytro camera. It's a light field camera, which if you go to the website for it, allows you to do some very cool things, but basically you can take in one shot a picture and then refocus it on the foreground, background or whatever after the fact. It also allows you to get a, a little bit of a 3D effect going as well. Essentially it takes hundreds of pictures at the same time. It was launched 2001 to great fanfare. You can see it's got a very sleek design and it's very, uh, uh, you know, compact. It's actually this is a very small camera, holds between two fingers. There was a large amount of venture capital interest in the venture. Uh, and even Steve Jobs, prior to his death, had approached the company uh, and was clearly interested in the technology. The company has attracted about $90 million in funding. What the Litro, Litro Field Camera decided to do was to launch its own product and to compete with established camera makers rather than cooperate. Because you could imagine that this technology was, it would be embedded in uh, systems. Uh, it could be integrated in current systems mobile phones even, uh, and certainly other cameras. This is the Nimi Heartbeat Lock. It's a bracelet that comes out of uh, Bionim, a firm that's part of uh, the Creative Destruction Lab at the University of Toronto. It was launched earlier this year in 2013 and it engages in a license, it, it sought initially to engage in a license model. That is, they had a technology whereby it could measure your heartbeat and or record your heartbeat and work out whether you are you. <laughs> Essentially, your heartbeat gives a signature for yourself. There's a bit of sophisticated stuff behind that, but imagine for the moment that that is exactly what works. And they students, uh, postdoctoral students, who were at the uh, heart of this, um, initially sought to license the technology. However, uh, they failed to find appropriate business partners. And so instead, under the auspices of the Creative Destruction Lab, they were pushed to actually launch a product, and you can see it here, you can go on the web and have a look at it, it's pretty slick looking for a company that wasn't thinking of doing that, wasn't even a company, only a few months earlier. So here's a company that chose to, to cooperate initially, or look for a cooperative strategy, 
and then pivoted to compete with um, with uh, other people who are making uh, lock devices or identity devices. This is Siri. You may not have seen this, but this is Siri in its initial incarnation. It was an app available on the iPhone that allowed you to basically have a conversation to look for restaurants, movies, other events, things going on. And it was pretty neat. Uh, they launched it as an app in 2009. And in 2010, Apple acquired the entire company behind it for about $200 million. We didn't know why then, but we do now after it was integrated in 2011 into the iPhone 4S and then subsequently into all other iOS devices after that. So Siri as a company chose to compete and then it pivoted to cooperate afterwards. Uh, another thing you might see. Now I say all these examples by way of showing what uh, business models people could choose and the differences between them. Let me give you a final one. This is the car of uh, one of the cars supplied by Better Place. Better Place uh, was one of the entrants into electric vehicles, uh, zero emission vehicles. Its idea was that what you'd have is you'd have swappable car batteries. In other words, they wouldn't try to recharge the batteries while you sat there in the car. You'd go to a station, take your old batteries out, you'd swap them for new ones and you drive and you'd be on your way. That was their technology. They attracted about 760 million in funding. There's a lot of VC funding for energy related ventures. But their business model was to integrate this technology into existing cars rather than to make a completely new car, which of course we know that Tesla was doing. So in other words, it chose to cooperate with car manufacturers. From here, you can see some of the different initial strategies chosen by the four companies I just outlined. Uh, Litro uh, chose to compete with uh, uh, camera makers, but they've gone fairly slowly, seeking to get patents and other things to control what they've got. Nimi, on the other hand, have also sought to control, to have a technology that they have uh, that's their asset to own, but they're looking Essentially, initially, they looked to look, cooperate with established firms for a licensing strategy. Siri's initial strategy was, of course, to compete with other app makers and to focus on having a very good app out there, focusing on execution. Finally, Better Place was trying to have a superior means of energy efficient cars, but was not trying to compete with existing car makers. Some of these firms after these initial models, learned something about those models and about the markets they were in, and they pivoted. So the later strategy for NIMI, for instance, moved towards competing with established firms and putting out a product uh, quickly, uh, so ceding some control because then everybody was aware of, their, of the idea of using a half beat signature. Siri, on the other hand, uh, cooperated now with an established firm, in this case Apple, and uh, obviously there's been more seeking of control of that technology as part of that. So we've seen these changes. For Better Place, well, Better Place essentially went bankrupt. It was unable to change its strategy, pivot or anything like that. And uh, Litro just hasn't lived up to its promise. One suspects a pivot is soon in their offing where they will end up going towards cooperating with existing firms. So in deciding uh, how to take your idea to a market, you have to decide what your initial strategy is. And a part of that equation is whether you can actually change it after the fact. Better Place, Place didn't seem to have that opportunity. These other firms uh, do have that opportunity, which gives them some fallback. And that can tell you about which business model you should try first. In choosing a business model, there are some very easy things that might present them for your business. For instance, control might be impossible. You might be in this sort of market where you can't, by uh, trying to apply for a patent or something like, like that, exclude others from doing similar things. Uh, it could also be that competing is too expensive. 
many uh, bio, bio uh, many bi biological science firms, biotech, biotech, I was looking for that word, biotech firms uh, uh, in, in, engage in licensing to establish pharmaceutical companies because competing is too expensive, requires them to have a whole distribution and regulatory infrastructure that's just too much. So it really isn't an option for them. You might have no potential partners with whom to uh, cooperate with. Uh, this was clearly what uh, uh, Bionim's issue was with the NIMI, uh, what became the NIMI technology. In each of these cases, you've got an easy choice. You do what's feasible. You may not have, when you finally ana analyze it, multiple paths, uh, multiple business models. And so in a broad sense, you're sort of forced into one box. When you don't have that, what you need to do is you're faced with a lot of uncertainty. And the only way to sort out that uncertainty is to experiment. But you have to decide when you're running an experiment, what the consequence of that experiment will be. What will you do if the outcome of the experiment is what you'd regard as a success? What will you do if the outcome is a failure? If it's a success, do you keep on doing the same thing? If it's a failure, do you keep on doing the same thing? Or where do you go after that? The experiment needs to be designed that it might actually help you with that future decision making, regardless of what the outcome of the experiment is. In other words, that experiment has to be designed so you learn something to help with future decision making. Just to give you another sense of that, consider Twitter. Twitter initially ran a very open platform, had all sorts of open APIs for developers, everybody could link to it, and we know it was very successful at that. But about a year ago, it started to do something different. It acquired some of those developers, the makers of Tweety and TweetDeck, uh, as two examples, so it put out its own apps. And then, a little bit later, it moved to limit the API calls on Twitter. Basically, you can only have 100,000, and after that, Twitter pretty much owns you, uh, or at least controls you. In other words, Twitter initially focused on execution, just being a better place uh, for people to devote their attention, but moved subsequently to control. Now, the reason it did that is it felt that it had to control these things in order to eventually work out how to monetize the platform. In other words, it hadn't really thought through that very well. Now, the problem with that is that obviously um, riled a lot of people. I should hopefully work out how to edit that out. If, I, if you're seeing this, I haven't. Um, it was initially focused on execution, so it moved to control, but it riled a lot of people. And there were at least concerns that Twitter might not uh, be successful after that point if another platform, uh, and it was experimented with app.net, which was a paid model but didn't have any of these controls, was successful. But I guess Twitter still is carrying on, although it's yet to lead, earn money. Experiments are costly, which is, you have to take into account. They take time, they take resources, and choosing one business model may prevent you from choosing another, as the Twitter example at least hints at. So it may not be possible to pivot from some business models. In a later lecture, we will discuss freemium models, whereby you give away a product for free. One of the implications of that is it's hard afterwards to charge for the model. Uh, SugarSync uh, used to have a freemium model whereby anyone could get an account to sync and back up their uh, documents for, uh, for free, uh, for up to five gigabytes. And then they would you pay if you want more than that. SugarSync then changed and got rid of the free option because really it wanted to, it was, it was obviously costing it too much uh, and they wanted to uh, uh, just make money where they could make money. Now, of course, the problem with this is you hey, had a whole lot of people who are using the product for free, and now those people were upset. And the question is, will that have long-term repercussions for that business? Similarly, Facebook has had to take great care in a lot of things that it's done 
to keep with its initial commitments to keep the activity stream as free. So can you control after you've chosen a path of execution? For instance, when you actually launch a product, you all of a sudden everybody knows about it. Whereas one of the aspects for control is to keep a product secret, specialized, out of the uh, under the radar, so to speak, and uh, and build up uh, reputation and other things and sort out kinks through that model. So if you execute and focus on getting to market quickly, you may not have the option to control later on. This is Marco Ahmed. He developed a few years ago a web service called Instapaper that later became an iPhone app. The model of Instapaper was, I guess, interesting. He produces this app and he was selling it for $4.99 and that was it. There was no ads, there was no nothing else. You could use it easily on the web for free, but if you wanted to use it on a mobile device, it would cost you. Here's what he said to plan up money. You charge a small amount of money and that's it, you're done. You don't need to go seek venture capital money. You don't need to sell out your users' privacy. They're not even your users. They're your customers. For the first time in a decade, it's great. In other words, he's just producing a product and selling it. My goal has never been to dominate the market, he says. My goal has always been to just make a living. And that's one of the things he was able to do. Having been part of founding of Tumblr, he then quit that job for, for a time and, uh, and focused on um, Instapaper as his full-time job. And he was able to do it because he was earning enough of a li living from selling a $5 app. Of course, even this notion of bringing an app to market, essentially in this case, a focusing on execution and uh, 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 competing with other apps, uh, is... is uh, is something you might tire of, and he eventually decided to sell the app to Betaworks. Not necessarily an established firm, or, but just a different model. He exited in a different way. But I think Betaworks is still continuing this as a uh, disruptive strategy. What can you learn from experiments? Well, you have to think. Have you measured the right things? What are you going to measure? Are you going to measure the number of users? Are you going to measure what the users do? Uh, are you going to measure how users interact with one another, whether they get value from each other? In order to do that, you better be sure your initial product is designed to give you feedback on those things. Another issue is correlation versus causation. This is an issue you will hear about in stats courses. Is the relationship that you're seeing from an experiment or from other data telling you, a is it mere correlation, or is there a causal story behind it? Now, if you think about your venture from an experimental point of view, you may be able to design it so that you can get causation out of it. Finally, you also have to worry about your interacting with other competing experiments. You're not running these things in a lab, you're running these things in a market. Now, maybe you're the only game in town, so it's as if you're on your own, but there could be other experiments running at the same time, which may muddy the waters of what you can learn from yours. So let's think about that for a second. This is Sebastian Thron. He uh, was a uh, brilliant computer scientist, Stanford professor, and also worked for Google X for a time on developing the self-driving car. A few years ago, he decided to put his artificial intelligence course on the web for free and to see what happened. And what happened was there was about 100,000 uh, 100, uh, or so people who actually logged on and took the course, many of whom from far-flung places of the earth, far away from Stanford, who completed this course. And in fact, of the top 400 uh, students in the course, none of them were from Stanford. Buoyed by that, Thron went on to found Udacity. Udacity is one of the many now providers of MOOCs, massively open, uh, massively open course. Ah, who, who, who remembers what that is? And by the time you see this video, I'm sure they won't exist anymore. However, he, he did so. And this was, and, and all the other ones also were buoyed by the 100,000 people doing this. This is going to be a great market. Now, 
Recently, Udacity decided to abandon that open model and to focus in on corporate customer. And the reason was this, is what they didn't realize from that initial experiment was that it was a once-off. There was a lot of fanfare, a lot of interest. There weren't any competitors at the time, and so people tried it out. Now, that was a very exciting thing. But did that mean that their activities were causing this? In other words, was it a chance event or was it something that was repeatable by their very actions? And it turned out to not be repeatable. And this is why you have to think very carefully about the data you're getting. So even a success, by success I mean things that are demonstrating a lot of demand, may not mean that you want to continue to invest in it. You have to understand where that success came from. Now, I don't doubt that people are smart at these might have considered that it was a fluke, etc., and maybe took a bet on it. But this is just a highlight that sometimes these success parameters can obscure something that is a once-off and not really a sustainable business. Let's consider an idea that's got a lot of press recently, mobile taxi and limo services. There have been plenty of entrants into this space where you use a map to get yourself a ride. There's Uber at the top there, uh, where you initially started with limos and now it's expanded to uh, black vans and, and SUVs, uh, SUVs and then taxis. Um, and you use a, a people, dri they have drivers who've signed onto their service and you use the app to call them. It's just wonderful. There's Halo, which is a very similar app operationally, uh, but Halo, what they've done is they provide their app and then allowed existing taxi cab companies to come onto their platform. There's Lyft. Lyft is particularly interesting. Lyft uh, doesn't worry about whether you're taxi drivers or not, and let anybody offer Lyfts on their platform after some accreditation. Uh, and then finally, there was an X36 company uh, from 2011, uh, called Winston, which launched an app called Fleetbit, Fleetbit, something like that. Uh, and uh, initially that was an app much like uh, Halo was supposed to be, but eventually uh, has become a back engine software for taxi companies. So in effect, now we see that these four firms, these four experiments have fallen into each of our four categories. Lyft seeks to provide a platform whereby uh, it competes with existing cab companies, uh, but it looks to build up the base of registered drivers and control the platform. Uber, on the other hand, doesn't uh, require anything like that. Uh, it just tries to be the best service out there, but is, is competing with existing cab companies, so is one of our classic disruptors. You have Halo. Uh, which is cooperating with existing taxi companies and is focusing on execution uh, to be uh, just a better platform for that. And you've got um, Fleetbit, which is cooperating with existing cab companies, but is essentially licensing our backed office services or essentially it's, it's IP or methods or code. Uh, so it's engaging in something closer to intellectual property strategy. By the way, there's no bright lines between these things, but I think it's fair to say at least the, these four firms are ordered on these dimensions in this way. Now what's interesting, of course, you should understand is you're having all these experiments taking place. We don't know which one is going to be successful, but the market has taken bets. For instance, it's put $82 million into Lyft. Of course, there was the next 36, 50,000 going into Fleet bit. 307 million has been given to Uber thus far and 50 million to Halo. So you can see that the market is betting on Uber as being the big solution here. But there are these other companies out there running businesses and let's face it, we don't know yet. And what is interesting is essentially each one of these is an experiment. And what they learn from it will tell us and the market what is going to be the successful model going forward. Your venture is an experiment and you need to figure out which of the multiple experiments you could run to run first.